Yeah. That's a weird. So, next speaker and last speaker of today is Dan Beter from Université d'Angers, and he will speak about Gamble and Tracy Widom in random partitions. Okay. Uh, Grazie tanto a Filippo e agli altri organizzatori per, per questo programma. Uh, I will speak in English nonetheless, not in Italian, although I could try. Uh, I, I was thanking Filippo and the organizers for, for this program and for the invitation. Uh, so this talk, uh, it's based on joint work with Jere on a series of papers with Jeremy Boutier, who used to be here. Uh, and uh, Alessandra Ocelli, both of them are at least physically in Lyon normally, uh, but Jeremy is based in Paris for, for work, and Alessandra at ENS de Lyon. And uh, ooh, this used to work, maybe I have to click on this. So the point of this talk, the aim is really to show how very so simple or somewhat simple co random combinatorial structures and mathematical physical structures can lead to fairly complex asymptotic uh, probabilistic and statistical behavior which is often encountered in uh, what i'm not going to speak about and that is the theory of random matrices so this is not a talk on random matrices but often objects that appear come from uh, random matrices uh, i will mostly speak about partitions and I want to do a small introduction uh, about two measures on partitions that are actually interesting, and then I'll, I'll present the actual results. So uh, partitions very simply are just lists, finite lists of uh, non-increasing numbers, integers. You see there are 2, 2, 2, 1, 1. Uh, and uh, if you write the partition in so-called Russian notation like this, and uh, if you trace the if you trace the profile and for so you see here I have two boxes two boxes I mean you can see how this is two 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 one one if you trace the profile and for every up step you put a hole and for every down step you unit step you put a particle you get a bijection between uh, so-called charge zero sequence of uh, particles and holes which you see there and and an actual partition this is called the Maya diagram the sequence of particles and holes. And uh, you will see more of this, presumably, throughout this uh, trimester. But partitions are very natural, discrete models of uh, both fermions and bosons. And, uh, well, models on partitions, so statistical models on partitions, can, uh, are, are, uh, can also dis can, can describe both uh, fermionic and bosonic models. This talk is fermionic only. You will not see much bosonic stuff in this model. And moreover, I will look at distributions on partitions, and I will always look, always throughout the talk, I will look at extremal statistics. So at extremal statistics, meaning if you take a random such object, you look at the distribution of the particle to the right, the largest part, largest particle, the fermion that's at, at the rightest on, on, on the lattice. I can also look their generalizations when you can look at the first few particles together and at the joint law of that. You can look at stuff that happens in the middle, in the bulk. All of that could be said for everything that I will be talk to, talking about. But throughout this talk, I will restrict myself to extremal statistics. So to the, to the distribution of lambda 1, this particle, when lambda is random. According to certain so more or less natural measures on such objects, uh, partitions have a size which is just the number of boxes. I'll denote that by absolute value of lambda. Here it's equal to eight, eight boxes. Uh, there are two natural distributions on partitions. One is just a uniform measure. Uniform measure is just that. You have u to the number of boxes in lambda, for u a parameter less than one, restricted to the size of lambda. This, is, this measure is obviously the uniform one on partitions of the same size. Uh, in the uniform case, it's been known for a while that lambda one is asymptotically gamble in a precise sense that, that I'll uh, describe in a moment. Another interesting measure on partitions that comes from representation theory and mathematical physics is the Plancherel measure. 
you see it written there, it's fairly complicated. You have a dimension, it's a dimension of an irre irreducible representation of a group, the, the, the group is the symmetric group on the number of letters which equals the size of lambda. Uh, but let me spend a couple of slides to actually say why the Planck-Chagall measure is actually interesting, the Poissonized Planck-Chagall. Uh, the Poisson parameter here is just uh, theta. I suppose there's no laser pointer, and for people online, uh, this is not useful in any case, but here I can just use my hands if I need to. Uh, probably there was a laser pointer in this, but I don't know how to use it. Ah, here. And, uh, right, so, so I'll uh, speak about Planck-Chagall in a second. The interesting thing about Planck-Chagall is that the extremal statistics, lambda one, the distribution of that is asymptotically tracy with them. Uh, GUE distribution, and these two distributions, the Gumball and the Tracy with them, couldn't be more diverse from one another. One's very complicated to write, the other is very simple. One is universal for correlated systems, like eigenvalues of Hermitian random matrices. The other one is universal for maxima of IID random variables. I'll be more precise in a second. So, Planck-Chagall measure, I mean, the story, I'm not giving you the right story for the Planck-Chagall measure and, uh, and uh, the tracy widom distribution, but it's one story I can give you. So consider the unit square, pick a Poisson random variable with the parameter theta squared, which is the parameter from Planck-Chagall. That's an, that's an integer, put that many uniform points in the unit square, that's a Poisson point process of parameter theta squared. And now look at the lo uh, largest path from here to here, meaning you're trying to eat as many points as possible going from here to here with, the, with segments that have slope between zero and one. Here, the largest path is equal to, zero, to four. This model is one of the earliest models of percolation. It's called directed last passage for percolation of, of Hammersley type. Hammersley being the person who actually invented percolation, at least mathematically. Uh, Though the normal percolation that uh, most people talk about is, is not this one, but it was also introduced by Hammersley. The interesting, uh, the interest in this model is what happens when, when uh, theta goes to infinity. So what happens to L, which is a random variable, which in this case is equal to four, when you have lots of points in the square? It should be said that L is also the longest increasing subsequence of a random permutation where that random permutation is from Sn where n is this Poisson random variable. This is just a bijection, you just order the points and then you see that the number of points that you eat is actually the length of this longest increasing subsequence in the permutation, four, seven, eight, ten. The sequence needn't be unique. And so the theorem is, and uh, this has been known for a while now, that this L, so this uh, length of the polymer, longest polymer that you can do, is equal in distribution with the first part, the extremal par uh, part of, the, of a partition, which I call lambda one, lambda one is the first part, and that partition has the Planck-Chagall distribution. You, you, you probably can ignore whatever is written here, you don't ever need it, at least not for this talk. Uh, so that, that's why, that's one of the reasons why the Planck-Chagall distribution is, is important in, in mathematical physics and uh, probability. There are other reasons, but I won't focus on them. Uh, if you wonder what this means, and this means it's all written here, it's not very important. S lambdas are the sure functions. I won't ever really talk about sure functions in this talk, but yeah, if you want, uh, they're on the slides, and presumably the slides will appear online at some point. And now the theorem about this L1 and about this, this lambda one and about this L, which is the longest increasing subsequence of a permutation. This is a result of uh, Beck, Dyfte, Johansson from 99. And it's that as theta goes to infinity, L is on average twice theta. And now the fluctuations, instead of having square root of something like you would expect in the central limit theorem, you have theta to the one third. And the limiting distribution is the tracy widom distribution, which you can write as a certain Fretholm determinant of this operator, which is the Airy 2 kernel. 
So this is an operator. This is the x. These are this is the line. Uh, so this is the row and this is a column. X and y are real numbers between s and infinity. So so uh, you need to define this properly as a as a thread home determinant, but that's fairly easy to do. A i is the array function, and it should be said that this distribution appeared previously and actually rather universally as the law of the largest eigenvalue of random Hermitian matrices with IID entries. So if you take almost any random Hermitian matrix with IID entries, as long as the entries have, I don't know, four or five moments, the largest eigenvalue, which is a real number because Hermitians, Hermitian matrices have real spectra, will always satisfy this distribution. After normalizing and rescaling in, in a, more or less in the same way as here, uh, there's sadly no such universality result for discrete models, this mo but this distribution appears quite often in discrete models as well, as we shall see. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen Fred Holm determinants yet, presumably everybody in the audience has seen one, but uh, in any case, this is a definition. This is how you define a Fred Holm determinant if you've never seen one. So I'll skip this slide because, uh, because this is fairly standard stuff. For the other probability distribution on partitions, which is the uniform distribution, things are actually much simpler and have been known for 80 years now. If you look at lambda 1, which is the largest part, instead of having theta and theta to the one third at the bottom, you have... So the interesting stuff happens when u goes to 1. Let's say as 1 minus something that goes to 0, m goes to infinity and then on average, lambda 1 is twice m log m, so already the scale is different. And then the order of the fluctuations is different. It's m to the power 1. And you get a much simpler distribution in the end, which is e to the minus e to the minus this, this double exponential, which is the standard Gumbel law. So in particular, you can write this distribution explicitly. There's no fret home determinant. Actually, you can write it as a fret home determinant, but it's a rather simple one. And uh, you can do this calculation by hand, actually, just from this law by playing with Q exponentials. It's not very difficult. Uh, and I should say that this gamble limit is also quite universal. For example, if you take IID random variables which have tails that decay like the normal distribution, uh, and you look at their maxima, they will always satisfy, the, maxim, the, the maximum will always be Gumbel. So this, this has been known in uh, extremal statistics since the 40s or 50s. There, there are papers on universality of this from the even earlier, 20s, 30s. Uh, so right now I want to talk about something that sort of combines the two together in a, in a weird but rather physical way. So some, yeah, there's a lag. I guess the internet is not going. Ooh, uh, okay. So I have to, one second, I have to. Let's hope this stabilized. There is some issue with internet, and if need be, I can probably plug in a cable, but I don't see any cable. Uh, yeah. If not, I, we can transfer it to, to the other computer if need be. Okay, so, so let me explain uh, sort of the first, the somewhat physical model that I'm talking about. So now I'm on a cylinder. These sides are, these sides are identified. And this cylinder is paved with squares. And in each square, I have a Poisson point process, but now with varying intensities. Here, the intensity is theta squared. In this square, which is the next square, the intensity is uh, u times theta squared, u squared times theta squared, and so on. I'm again looking at the longest upright path. I'm trying to eat as many points as possible. From here, going actually all the way to infinity. You can go to infinity because almost surely the number of points that you'll have on the cylinder is finite. 
So this, this, this length of the polymer from here all the way to infinity is finite. I call it L. And actually for simplicity, I'll take the convolution of L which with, with, uh, with kappa one. Uh, so what's kappa one? Kappa one is written there, but I can give you the distribution of kappa one. So kappa one less than or equal to M is just, it's equal to U to the, I think M plus one U infinity where U X is just the Pockhammer symbol. Uh, u to the i x zero less than or equal to i less than or equal to n minus one. Uh, kappa one is also the first part of a random uniform partition. But here's the distribution. Unless I did so, I'm, uh, unless I'm off by one here, this should be the distribution. Uh, so uh, kappa one is very well known. It's essentially a stand. It's a discrete gamble. It has a discrete gamble law. So I'm have. So I have this longest polymer. I convolute with something that's uniform, and actually you can do the deconvolution in a very nice way. And there are some recent combinatorial results by Imamuga, Munchikoni, Sasamoto where they do this. Uh, but I, I won't speak about this. Presumably either Tomohiro who's gonna be here later on or Matteo Muchiconi who's also gonna be here later on might speak about this. Uh, I can just give you the result, but before I give you the result, uh, this lambda one actually comes from what I call a two partition model. Why this is interesting I'll, uh, will become maybe clearer in a second. So what's a two partition model? Well, it's a, it's a model on two partitions, it's a distribution on two partitions, mu and lambda. And this distribution kind of looks like the Planck-Chagall distribution, if you remember how that looks, except here I have, instead of having lambda, I have lambda over mu. So what's lambda over mu? If you have two partitions, first of all, you only look at configurations that are, one is contained in the other, otherwise the, the weights are gonna be zero. And if you have a partition that's, let's say, let me do this with as little boxes as possible. So one partition is equal to four, three. And the other partition is equal to, to one. So lambda over mu is just what remains when you take one partition out of the other. So this is this, these four boxes. Uh, so, so there's a subtle interaction between these two partitions, which is actually not very, it's not, the, the interaction is rather indirect actually, uh, as, it, as it is. And uh, if you just consider this factor, it doesn't make much sense. So you need to weigh one of the partitions by its size uh, to, to even make combinatorial sense, let alone probabilistic sense. You can write this in terms of so-called sure functions. It's again, not very important for, for the purpose of this talk. Uh, the point is that when u is equal to zero, mu disappears because this gets supported on mu equals zero. So you only get lambda here. So mu, mu is equal to zero identically. So you get the Planck-Chagall distribution. When, thet when theta is equal to zero, lambda needs to be equal to mu and you get the uniform distribution. So when theta is equal to zero, all of this disappears and you only have this factor. Uh, U here is e to the minus inverse temperature for, uh, this, this will become relevant a little bit later on. So I'll remind you of this in a second. So what's, uh, what's the result? The result is as follows that as U goes to one, to see something non-interesting, you have to take U to one in this way where m goes to infinity. So what's m? m is the ratio between theta and one minus u. Uh, so this means in particular that theta has to be of the order m to the two thirds. This is not hard to see. Well, you have something like the bike dive to Hanson, this uh, back dive to Hanson result, the same scaling, except what you, what you have in the limit now is this f alpha, which is a Fred Holm determinant again of the same sort as the Tracy Widom except the operator is different. It looks like this. 
And it's the so-called finite temperature airy operator or airy kernel, of which I'll say more in, in a couple of slides. Uh, actually, the next slide. So first, same type of scaling as, uh, as uh, the back dive to Hansen, but rather with a different object in, in the limit. Why is that object interesting? So here's, if you take nothing else from this talk, here's the slide that you should, uh, uh, here's the sort of more, impor mo more important, most, most important in some sense slide of the talk. Well, that kernel and distribution, Johansson uh, showed us that it interpolates as alpha. Alpha here, you should think of inverse limiting temperature. So alpha, you should think of inverse temperature. Sorry, may I ask a yeah. question? Uh, uh, what is the, pro you probably will talk about it, but what is the fermion interpretation of this model? Uh, I will talk about it in four or five slides. Uh, so F alpha interpolates between Tracy Widom at zero temperature and Gumbel at infinite temperature. And again, these distributions couldn't be more different. One you see in correlated systems, and it's fairly universal, at least in continuum systems. In discrete systems, you have to work quite a bit to get this distribution, and you'll see more talks about this even this week. And the other is much simpler, and uh, it appears as maxima of extremal statistics of IID. And that's because the, the kernel itself well, when you take it to infinity, you get the airy kernel. When you take it to zero, it's more subtle, but you get a diagonal kernel whose Fredholm determinant gives the Gumbel distribution. Uh, so this is why such things are actually interesting. This and uh, the next slide, which says that this distribution actually appears in quite a few models already. So it appears in random matrix and the continuous fermions at the edge, starting with the work of Johansson and then was rediscovered later by Dean Ledusal, Majumdar, Sher, Lichty Wang, and, and other people. In discrete systems, well, our result is one result where it appears. And then also in discrete and continuous systems, it appears in the scaling of the Kardar Parisi Zhang equation. I will not speak at all about the Kardar Parisi Zhang equation, but if you know what that is, if you start it with Kardar, so KPZ equation on the real line, if you start with delta initial conditions, you get the same scaling for the height function for the solution where alpha plays the role of time. So the finite temperature for me is finite time for people working in KPZ, uh, starting with Sasamoto Spon, Calab Calabrese Le Dussalgus Rosso, Amir Corin Castel, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. This distribution has been also studied in its own right by people in the Riemann Hilbert community. Mattia Cafasso, Tom Kleist, uh, Thomas Botner, uh, Sofia Taricone, etc. Uh, so let me just do a brief interlude and say how this distribution actually appeared first in physics and random matrices. So what Johansson did, he was looking at a certain matrix, two matrix model called the Moshe Neuberger Shapiro model. And it's a matrix model that's a model, it's a distribution on unitary and Hermitian matrices, so on two matrices. Kind of looks like the GUE distribution on Hermitian matrices, if you've ever seen that one, and I'm sure most people here have. But then there's this interaction between the Hermitian and the unitary matrix, this sort of Harish Chandra type interaction, Itzik Sonziberg interaction. And what Johansson proved, and Lichty and Wang actually proved it in the way I'm stating it here, is that as the size of the H matrix goes to infinity, so H has a spectrum, lambda one bigger, is the biggest eigenvalue, at the edge of the spectrum, you get the, the distribution that I introduced. So, so the distribution was introduced by Johansson in 2006 as this sort of limit. Actually, this limit is for technical reasons, I've written the work, I've written the limit that Lichty and Wang uh, obtained because Johansson's is a bit more complicated to write down, but it's essentially the same thing. I mean, this is just a minor technicality to fit things on a slide. Uh, so I had a two partition model. Here you have a two matrix model and 
again, Moshe Neuberger and Shapiro were interested in such distributions, well, for various reasons, but one is that their behavior, both bulk and edge behavior, interpolates between uh, easy stuff and hard stuff. So for example, for the bulk behavior, you also get an interpolation between Poisson, a Poisson point process and the sine kernel at the other end. And for the edge, you get interpolation between Gumbel and Tracy Widom. Uh, let me not speak about that uh, anymore and get to, the, to a fermionic interpretation. How would you prove the theorem that I, uh, that I stated? Well, actually the proof goes through several uh, steps. So it goes through some Fox space techniques, which, I, which I'm gonna explain in a second. But basically, if you augment your probability, so you have a two, two partition model, if you augment it with an independent random variable of everything else that has this distribution here. Uh, so for the physicists in, uh, in the room, but also for the mathematicians, U is E to the minus inverse temperature, and you should think of T to be E to the mu times inverse temperature, where mu is chemical potential. Uh, so t is, a, t is a chemical potential parameter. Once you introduce this chemical potential that keeps track of the so-called charge, I'll explain in a second what it is. And if you look at the shifted point process associated with the partition, so you add a random shift to every part, these are just the particles and holes from, from the original picture of a partition, from the fermionic picture but with a random shift, that's the same everywhere. Once you do that, you get a determinantal point process, meaning that certain probabilities are endpoint correlation functions are determinants of a very simple operator called the Bessel operator, Be Bessel kernel in finite temperature. And then for these things, there are standard, standard and somewhat less standard asymptotic analysis techniques uh, to show convergence in the limit. So, so once you get the finite result, it's a bit of work to get to get the limit, but it's fairly well known steepest descent analysis. So, so let me focus a bit on, on this part, on the algebraic part. And this is a very condensed slide, but if you start with a representation of Fox space acting on so if you start with a Hilbert space who has as bases, the basis is indexed by vectors, which are infinite sequences of particles and holes. To the right, you have particles at infinity. To the left, you have holes. Let's say the origin is here. Such a vector, you can always write it as a partition and a charge. I, I use bracket notation here. So the partition is obvious, four to one. And the charge is just the number of particles to the right of the origin minus the number of holes to the left. So the charge is equal to two. So you have a creation and annihilation operators on this space, psi and psi star. They try to either put or remove, par so psi tries to put a particle if there's none with a sign and psi star tries to remove it. And they satisfy canonical commutation relation. Uh, sorry, this should be an A, canonical anti-commutation relations, which are given here. Uh, then from this, you can construct the so-called bosons, which are, uh, I'm only interested in the first bosons plus my alpha plus minus one, which sort of make particles bounce around either to the right or to the left by one unit. So you write them, they're bilinear in the fermions. And then you actually realize that the probability distribution that you have can be written in Fox space in this way. So, so you have, uh, well, you have two matrix elements of two, two operators, alpha one, alpha negative one were, were already written. H and C are just the energy operator on Fox space and the charge operator. So, and they're both diagonal. So once you have this, you can see that the probability that you have particles at certain positions, fixed positions, so let's say you fix this position and this position, what's the probability that you have particles here, n is equal to two in that case? Well, you can introduce a product of such operators. This operator 
only picks out configurations where you have a particle at position ki. Everything else is killed. Well, because this removes the particle and this puts it back in and the signs cancel if there is a particle there and otherwise it kills the state. And it turns out that an old re result, well, it goes back at least to Godin in the 60s, but probably even earlier. Well, first of all, that probability can be written as a trace of, on this Fox space. That's not very difficult because essentially you have to sum over all lambda and mu where this condition is satisfied. So summing over all lambda, you sum over the inner ket bra. Summing over all mu, you take the trace and C as well, and uh, all charges C. And uh, it turns out that there is a thing called, uh, some of you probably have heard of this uh, many times before, weak lemma in finite temperature, which essentially says that once you have this and everything is bilinear in the fermions, you can write it in our case as uh, a determinant of the two-point function. And this is the two-point function. Uh, Sometimes it's not a determinant, sometimes it's something else here, a Fafian or even more complicated uh, objects, but always of the two-point function. And then the two-point function actually, if you do the analysis a bit, you have to pass to the Fourier transform or the Fourier series. The two-point function is exactly this. So the two-point function comes out to be this after, after some standard calculations using Bessel functions. Uh, so the fermions are, are, are hidden here. So I could have started with a model on Fox space given by this, and I could have started, actually I could have done even better. I could have written a Hamiltonian and I could have hidden a, uh, written a transfer matrix and, and whatnot. They're kind of hidden in, in this formula. I haven't done it, but I could have written it. And it's in the paper. Uh, and once you have this finite result, as I said, somewhat standard asymptotic analysis techniques uh, lead you to the final asymptotic result that I gave. Uh, there's also a, uh, there also, uh, so everything can, put, can be put in the same, uh, in one picture, in the following sense. So I had this inverse temperature parameter in my model, U, uh, the u that's from here, and I had this theta, which is the Poisson parameter in my statistical model. And it turns out if theta times inverse temperature squared goes to something finite, non-zero, then we have this tracy widom distribution. Uh, then we have this finite temperature tracy widom distribution. Now, if theta times inverse temperature squared goes to zero, it means that the temperature goes to infinity very fast. So normal consider considerations in statistical physics would tell you that thermal fluctuations actually should dominate. And in that case, you should see maxima of some sort of uh, Gaussian behavior. And indeed, in that case, you see Gumbel behavior. So this is a, there's a precise statement be behind this result, but I just want to explain the idea behind it, not the statement itself. The statement is not very important. If theta beta inf squared goes to infinity, it means that, uh, it means that actually inverse temperature goes to infinity, means, meaning temperature goes to zero very fast. And if you have a model in zero temperature in physics, you expect, uh, at least all physicists expect that, uh, you expect that quantum effects uh, take hold. And indeed the tracy widom distribution is, is a quantum mechanical distribution. As a matter of fact, I mean, random matrices were introduced to to study quantum uh, quant spectra of uh, quantum uh, mechanical uh, systems. So, so in, in that case, you sort of expect the tracy widom distribution to appear in the limit, and this is exactly what we have. If neither is the case, it means there's a balance between thermal and quantum, and then you get this finite temperature stuff. Uh, all three results are explicitly written in the paper. I don't want to bother with the details because, well, this I, I gave you and this is, very, this is very simple to write, but this is some, somewhat a bit more complicated. Uh, but again, the interesting thing is this sort of interpolation, which many physicists uh, 
would expect, but which mathematically has only appeared in a few scattered models here and there uh, between uh, quantum and thermal. Okay, so, so for the remainder of the remaining 15 minutes of the talk, I will actually talk about simpler things, but somehow that, that, that uh, give rise to even possibly even more complicated behavior. So the very first simple thing I want to talk about, and there are many ways of, of explaining this model, I want to talk about plane partitions. Plane partitions are just cubes in the corner of the room, that's simple. The number of cubes is called the volume. Here the volume is, oh God, it's not written. Oh well, you can, <laughs> somebody can do the counting if they want. So the number of cubes uh, here is the volume. Q to the volume is actually a very natural model on plane partitions. And plane partitions appear quite naturally and have been, have been appearing for about 100 years in combinatorics, also in algebraic geometry. So the previous speaker uh, who is there at the back probably can explain to you how plane partitions appear in uh, computational algebraic geometry. And uh, they appear naturally in mathematical physics as well ever since well, they've certainly appeared in the past 20 some years in string theory, especially. Uh, I, forget the, I forget the actual word that string theorists use for plane partitions, but uh, it'll come to me after the talk, unfortunately. Another natural statistic on the plane partitions that you can keep track of, and it's actually interesting, uh, is the trace. And the trace is just the number of boxes in the middle, which is equal to 12. So the number of boxes under the, under the red here. So I just have a two parameter model on plane partitions, Q to the volume, A to the trace. A and Q you should think of as numbers less than one. Uh, trace is necessarily vertical, yes. Because actually if you look at the projection from, from above, this is this is a two-dimensional array of numbers, and then the trace is just the matrix trace that you would expect. So this is, a, this is a matrix of numbers which are just the heights, and then the trace is the actual trace. That's why I call it trace. And again, we look at the highest part of this plane partition, which is this guy. Uh, I can look at other parts in the plane partition. I'm not going to do that. It just takes more uh, space to state the result. The highest part is equal in distribution to a so-called first part of a sure measure. Uh, if you don't know what that means, you can completely ignore this because I'll never use it. Uh, it's a sure function you evaluated at a principal specialization. This is only for combinatorialists among us. Uh, so I'll just look at this peak. Well, it turns out that this peak actually has has a, an interpretation in terms of longest increasing subsequences and longest polymers. Uh, let me give you, so if you have, let me say what it is. If you have in the, quart, in the quadrant, which I orient this way, on each, each dot is an IID, not IID, it's an independent geometric random variable. And on each diagonal, you have the same distribution, which is a geometric with parameter a times q to the power, which is the number of the diagonal. So this is an inhomogeneous model. You could think about putting q equals to one here. It doesn't make sense, but mentally it does make some sort of sense. And then you would get to, 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 to a model that was introduced by Johansson, at least if you restrict to a finite uh, size. And then you look at the longest, path you can take. So what's the length of a path is just the sum of the numbers you encounter. Each, each dot is a random integer. You sum them all up. You maximize overall paths. And you can do actually two, two maximizations. One maximization, you start from here, you go all the way to infinity. And you look at the maximal such path. Almost surely it's finite, so it makes sense. Another maximization, which is actually weird, but interesting, you start from here somewhere at negative at infinity and you go in this direction and you maximize over all such paths like the blue path. Point is L1 is equal to L2 in distribution. This is not at all obvious and 
probabilistically or even in mathematical physics, this is very difficult to see. I mean, for me, it's impossible to see unless you, you, you do some combinatorics. But is, these are also equal to, with these weights, these are also equal in distribution to the law of this guy. So all of these are equal in distribution, all of these four things. And the result, which is actually a, a similar result was obtained for a certain exponential model. Well, it's a bit of a long story, of a, of a long story, but there, there was a previous result of Johansson at least for half of the things that I'm giving you here for, for uh, in, in the exponential case, so uh, not with geometric random variables. The result is as follows. Well, you have two parameters, Q and A, and there, it's actually interesting to send them both to one, not at the same rate, but at comparable rates. And then any of the previous random variables that I described. So now you don't have things that are M to the one third anymore. What you have is epsilon inverse log of epsilon inverse, M log M, where M is epsilon inverse, uh, twice that uh, quantity, uh, L grows as twice that uh, uh, quantity, and then it has order M fluctuations. And then what you get in the limit, you can write as a fred home determinant, and what's the fred home determinant in the limit? Well, it's actually the best cell alpha, alpha is A, essentially. It's the best cell alpha uh, kernel, with a twist, and that twist is important, in exponential coordinates. So this, is, this object here is universal at the hard edge of random matrices. I mean, there are results about the universality of such objects by Terry Tao and Van Wu, but probably other people as well. Um, perhaps Erdős and company have also universality results about Bessel. This object is again universal in random matrices. Uh, it's not so universal if you look at exponential coordinates. But then why is this interesting? Well, again, Kurt uh, told us about 2008. Actually, he made it as a remark, and in our paper, we formalized it, but the proof is just a change of variables. And however, it depends on some rather non-trivial result in random matrices. This distribution also interpolates between Gumbel and Tracy Widom. Uh, as written here, when I alpha, I don't want to call it inverse temperature, when alpha goes to zero, you get uh, Gumbel. When alpha goes to infinity in this complicated way, you get Tracy Widom. And actually, the Gumbel result, uh, I even have a GitHub, because uh, I didn't believe it actually until I spoke to Kurt a few months ago. Well, no, I believed it, but it was very, obscure why this happened. So I actually checked it numerically. So I even have a Mathematica on my GitHub to actually prove it. But in any case, there, there's a, the proof is not simple. This is not a simple proof. This is a simple proof. This by no means, because it relies on a somewhat deep result of Alan Edelman in random matrices. Uh, as always, so we have this Q to the volume, A to the trace. We can put everything in one picture. If alpha goes to, well, if A is equal to one, we get, gam, uh, we get Gumbel, and this is actually a result of Vershik Yakubovich. If alpha is less than one on a different scale, uh, we get Tracy Widom. I'm not writing down the explicit result, but it's possible. And the result I told you about is this one, where alpha goes to one in this critical regime. And the interpolation here happens through this Bessel thing. And now for another five minutes, well, okay, so you have plane partitions and before that I had some sort of last passage percolation on a cylinder. Can you look at both at once? The answer is yes. Uh, you can look at so-called cylindric plane partitions. So cylindric plane partitions are exactly what the name implies, cubes in a room, but then that room, you wrap it around the cylinder. So you see here, these two vertical sides are identified. Uh, there are several natural parameters to be interested in here. So one, one statistic is the volume. 
the number of boxes, so I'm, I, I'll put a parameter Q for that. Another statistic, much as before, is the trace. The trace is the middle here, and I'll put another parameter A for that. And the third statistic, which is actually important for this to make sense, is what I call the seam. And it's the number of cubes which are here when you glue, when you glue these things together. And I could, I could put a third parameter, call it U for that quantity. I'm not because there are already too many parameters. I'm gonna actually hidden in there. That parameter is the A minus one Q to the negative N where n here is three. So n is just this size. n is half the size of the, half of the circumference. Uh, cylindric plane partitions actually appeared much later than plane partitions. They're interesting from a combinatorial point of view. They're all also interesting from a, from a theoretical physics point of view. There are papers of Omar Foda and collaborators and papers of other string theorists who, whose names I forget now uh, on, on why such objects appear naturally in physics. And in uh, physicists are usually interested in, in uh, generating functions for such things, partition functions. They're also interesting in combinatorics because they're so related to, and theoretical physics, because they're related to Roger Ramanujan identities, if you know what those are the sort of cylindric plane partitions are the natural uh, model for Rogers, Rogers Ramanujan, or are a natural model for that. Nevertheless, here I'm looking at this distribution at the probability, which is the same as I have before, except now I'm on the cylinder and I have this seam that I keep track of. And I'm looking at the tip, uh, at the top, uh, at, uh, at the peak. And, uh, Again, we have uh, the peak is the same as the first part of something that's a two partition model. Uh, let me not get into that, but there's also a last passage percolation interpretation. So I have this random variable kappa one, which was written here. And I take the convolution of that with the longest path on a certain cylinder, which I call L, the length of that path. And that's this, uh, that's this peak in law, in distribution. So what's, what's that path? I should have put both of them on the same size. So this L, this L here is the largest polymer. You, you try to uh, maximize the length of your path. We're again on the cylinder, we have a directed polymer. And now you also have this inhomogeneous uh, weights. So your cylinder is paved by these n by n squares, capital N. And each square has smaller squares in size. And basically on each diagonal or rather horizontal line, the random variable that you have is gonna be geometric with parameter A times Q to the number of that line. So there is a fairly natural model of last passage percolation on a cylinder that, uh, that uh, exists for such things. And again, you're, you're, you're taking this from zero all the way to infinity because actually by Borel Cantelli, almost surely you're only gonna see finitely many non-zero numbers. So, so that, that length is gonna be finite. And uh, Okay, so this is the last slide and it's also the most complicated slide. So let me give you the, the result. Well, actually the second to last slide. The result is there are several, well, actually there are many scaling limits you can take. Uh, the two that we actually have considered in the paper uh, joint with Alessandro Ocelli, n fixed, n here is just the width of the cylinder. So n is three here. In all cases, Q goes to one. If Q doesn't go to one, you can do the asymptotics. You essentially get Tracy Widom or Gumbel. Uh, no, sorry, you, you only get Tracy Widom if Q doesn't go to one, if you get something non-trivial. We, we haven't considered that, but it's not that difficult. So Q goes to one in both scaling regimes. Q keeps track of the vo volume. So we're looking at very large volume plane, uh, cylindric plane partitions. Uh, N fixed and A goes to one critically 
we have somewhat the same thing as before, twice m log m as law of large numbers and m as order of fluctuations, where now the Fredholm determinant is of a certain operator, which kind of looks like the Bessel operator, except you have this Fermi factor here with capital N appearing. And uh, you should think of capital N here as, which is an integer, as being inverse temperature. So this is some sort of uh, Bessel kernel in inverse temperature and also in exponential coordinates. So if you know the Bessel kernel or you remember it from my previous slide, you usually have X and Y here. So I, here I have E minus X, E minus Y. The other regime, which is actually simpler is, uh, well, maybe not simpler, but uh, the other regime is actually very similar to what I told you at the beginning. And it's when the width of the cylinder grows, but A is fixed. So A is fixed less than one, doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's not zero. But then N goes to infinity as epsilon to the minus two thirds, where epsilon goes to zero. And in this regime, for certain uh, specific constants, I recover again the order one third type of fluctuations that I had at the beginning and that also were in the random matrix theory side of things and also in the Beck Dive Johansson theorem. So if n goes to infinity slowly like this and a is fixed, you get uh, finite temperature airy. If n is fixed, and A goes to one critically, you get finite temperature Bessel. So here it's some sort of hard edge in finite temperature. Here is the soft edge of random matrices in finite temperature. There are many things you can ask. Already this finite temperature Bessel when N goes to infinity, as I explained on the few slides ago, already that guy interpolates between Gumball and Tracy Widom. Uh, there are many more limits you can do. I should say that all of these models are discrete analogs of continuous polymers in various sorts of traps. Uh, so not continuous polymers, continuous fermions, non-interacting fermions in various types of uh, tra harmonic traps. These models of continuous fermions have been described by Le Dussal, Majum, Dagsher and company in quite a bit of detail in papers starting around 2017. So in the past five years, there, there has been a lot of activity by these people on the physics side and on the continuous fermion side of things. What I described are discrete analogs of most of the models that, that they had. There are other limits you can do. The, I mean, there's a whole zoo of things here that happens that hasn't been explored. But uh, in any case, I won't talk about it. And uh, with that, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Any question? Th thank you. Very nice talk. Uh, can you continue what do you get extra being discrete compared to those continuous fermion models. So what, what, what's the difference? Oh, well, what, what I get extra? No, no, I don't get anything extra. I just get discrete counterparts of, of those continuous fermionic models. But statistics is the same as, as in, in those models. But in the limit, they have the same statistics, yes. And they're not in, actually, so in the first case that I was mentioning, there, it's not like the discrete stuff goes in the limit to the continuous type. They sort of live on the same uh, plane. The last model I described, cylindric plane partitions, with a bit of work, you can take Q and A to one in certain regimes and rediscover the discrete models of uh, the continuous models of Ledusag, Majum, Dag, Shag and company. From the beginning. From the, from, from, from the beginning of the theory, yes. So the last discrete model, because it has so many parameters, you can probably recover the continuous fermions of uh, in, uh, you know, quadratic harmonic potentials, for example, and finite temperature of Le Dussal, Majum, Dag, and Shag. Nobody has tried to do it, but I don't think it's particularly hard. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? If not, thank you again.